Natasha Romanoff was trained in the Red Room, but the Black Widow film has revealed something quite astonishing about the Red Room and its location. In this video, I'm going to take a look at some of the science behind the Red Room. Hi there, I'm Dr. Barry Fitzgerald, a superhero scientist, and on this channel, you're going to find videos about science, superheroes, and lots more besides. If you're like in this video, well, please do give it a like. It's time to take a look at some of the science behind the Red Room. Black Widow had some big reveals, but perhaps the most surprising in the film was the location of the Red Room. The Red Room is the Russian facility used to train young women as elite spies known as Black Widows. It turned out that the Red Room wasn't on the ground at all, and in fact was in an aerial facility in the skies over Russia. In fact, it could be argued that the Red Room kinda looks a little bit like Cloud City from Star Wars. Just saying. Let's take a look at some of the science behind the Red Room, and in particular, I'm gonna look at three different aspects. Number one, how does the Red Room float in midair? Number two, how do people breathe when they're standing outside the Red Room, given that it's, well, it's in the sky, and how do they do that without oxygen tanks? Number three, where does all the toilet waste from the Red Room go? First of all, let's take a look at some of the physics behind the floating of the Red Room in mid-air. Well, it all comes down to the engines, of course. They are really important, and in the film, well, the engines are destroyed, which is why the Red Room plummeted back towards terra firma. To explain how the Red Room floats, we need to take a look at the main forces acting on the Red Room. Now, here is the Red Room above the skies of Russia with a mass M. From the mass we can calculate the weight and the weight is acting downwards. Let's move the weight over towards the right to make things a little bit clearer. Now to keep the Red Room in the air you need a force that will counteract the weight of the Red Room and that's going to come from the engines or the thrust force from the engines. Now we can replace all that text with some symbols. In this case the weight is calculated from the mass by multiplying it by g acceleration due to gravity and the force from engines i've represented now as f e the condition to float is this the force from the engines must exactly balance or equal the weight of the red room if that's the case then it's going to float and stay in its position above the ground however if you wanted to perhaps change the position of the red room well if the force of the engines is greater than the weight, then the red room will go up. However, if the force from the engines is less than the weight, then the red room will go down. And that's exactly what happens in the film, because at some point, the force from the engines decreases significantly. Now, all of this has something to do with a certain physicist called Isaac Newton, who did a little bit of work, I believe, a few hundred years ago in relation to some important theories. And some of those theories related to how things move and also to gravity. Now this all has something to do with Newton's laws of motion and Newton and his work in physics. In the situation with the Red Room, I've just included two forces. That's the weight of the Red Room and the force being generated by the engines of the Red Room. And we can calculate a net force acting on the Red Room. And that is given by the force upwards in the positive direction of the engines minus the weight, which is in the negative direction or downwards of the Red Room. But in the film, the force from the engines suddenly, well, goes to zero because the engines are destroyed. Now, let's imagine that in the film they instantaneously go to zero. That means that Fe would suddenly be zero and the new net force acting on the Red Room is just minus W. Now, according to Newton's second law of motion, the net force on an object is equal to the mass of that object multiplied by the acceleration of that object. Now we have two expressions for the net force, one being minus W and the other coming from Newton's second law of motion, that the net force is equal to mass times acceleration. We can replace W by mg and we can put these two expressions equal to each other and we have ma is equal to minus mg and guess what, the m's can go and what we have is the acceleration of the red room is given as a equal to 
minus g and that makes a lot of sense because when you throw an object into the air and when it starts to come back down that is the acceleration that the object will experience and if it's accelerating then there is a velocity or an increase in velocity and in the case of the red room because it's accelerating towards the ground and it's getting faster there's only one result going to happen with the red room and that is crashing back down to terra firma You'll have noticed in the film that the Widows and Drakov were not wearing oxygen tanks or anything like that. Well, they were inside of the Red Room, which probably had its own controlled environment similar to that that you would have on an airplane. Nevertheless, the Red Room was up in the sky. So what was the approximate altitude of the Red Room? Well, one thing for sure, it's definitely less than 8,000 meters. In climbing circles, this is known as the death zone. The death zone is the point at which someone would need supplemental oxygen in order to basically be able to breathe and stay alive. Now that's a rough cutoff point and it really depends on the individual. To be more precise, the death zone is the height at which the pressure of oxygen in the surrounding atmosphere is insufficient for a person to stay alive for an extended period of time. In the film Black Widow, Natasha Romanoff, Yelena, Melina and the Red Guardian are all seen wandering around outside on the platforms of the Red Room near the end of the film. And all of them are doing this without oxygen masks or oxygen tanks. And none of them seem to be complaining about the lack of oxygen or having problems breathing. Although, to be honest, I think they were probably a little bit more concerned with the fact that the Red Room was in the process of exploding. So, in my opinion, from a rough estimate, I would say that the Red Room was at an altitude between 3,000 meters and 5,000 meters. And in addition to that, we see Natasha Romanoff grab a parachute as she's jumping off the Red Room, which might indicate that the Red Room was at a height which would be safe for someone to do a parachute jump without an oxygen tank. And finally, Drakov and the Widows were all living and stationed on the Red Room for quite some time. So where did all their toilet waste go? Did they just drop it out of the sky? That'll be kind of disgusting to be honest. Let's imagine that although Drakov is a master villain intent on taking over the world, that he still had a semblance of care for the environment and proper waste management. I'm going to assume that the toilet system on the Red Room was equipped to recycle water from urine at the very least. Solid matter is another issue altogether so perhaps they just collected it and then every now and then they would fly down a whole bunch of solid waste down to earth and dispose of it in a responsible and ethical way. But if you happened to be living underneath the Red Room, don't worry. I seriously doubt that Drakov was dropping his toilet waste from the Red Room. You see, that would be a bad idea because if Drakov was actually doing that, he'd be giving away the position of the Red Room through the dropping of large amounts of toilet waste. So it would have been in his interest to make sure that the toilets weren't leaking. Otherwise, Drakov and the Widows would have been caught sooner and Drakov would have found himself in a whole lot of sh Thanks for watching this video in relation to some of the science behind the Red Room from Black Widow. Be sure to stay tuned for more videos in relation to science, engineering, superheroes, Star Wars and lots more topics. And please subscribe to this channel if you want to keep up to date with the latest videos. I've been Dr. Barry Fitzgerald, the superhero scientist and until I see you next time, always think super.